Great. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, our guest speaker for the MA Anthrozoology Residential this year, um, Dr. John Bradshaw from the School of Veterinary Sciences at the University of Bristol. Um, John's going to be talking to us about um, uh, research which I think um, is covered in his recent book, um, The Animals Among Us. And John has very kindly brought copies of the book which he can um, make available to anyone who'd like to buy one um, after the talk for the um, trade price of five pounds per copy. Um, so John is um, a well-known anthrozoologist for those of us who are, who are on the anthrozoology program here at Exeter. Um, he was a founding member of the International Society of Anthrozoology and formerly acted as the science chair for the International Association of Human-Animal Interactions Organizations. Um, uh, uh, John was formerly reader in Companion Animal Behaviour and University Research Theme Leader for Animal Welfare and Behaviour at the University of Bristol. And um, prior to that, he was Senior Research Fellow at the University of Southampton, where he found, founded the Anthrozoology Institute. So um, I, I will hand over now to John, who's going to um, talk to us about the animals in our midst, how pet keeping evolved. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I, yes, I have, I've written a book uh, called The Animals Among Us, which is a summary of research that I and many other people have done over the last 25 or so years on uh, the subject that many of you are studying. Um, and it may have surprised you, particularly if you were really enrolled on the course, to see that the subtitle of the book is The New Science of Anthrozoology, because you were thinking, well, actually, I'm studying. This can't be that new. Um, I don't get to choose the subtitles uh, for, for any of the books that I, pro that I produce. The publishers do that. And, and I must say, I was slightly uneasy about this because I thought it's not actually that new. I mean, it may be new to the general public, which is whom, at whom the, this book is aimed, but uh, certainly not to you guys. So, um, yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't assume that everything in there is new. It, it isn't. Um, a lot of it goes back 25 years because one of the things I've tried to do in the book is to look at the history of the subject and try to, in a subtle way, determine where it might be going in the future. Because there are a few of us, um, the name Hal Herzog immediately springs to mind, um, uh, have some reservations about the direction it's going in. But that's a, that's a totally academic thing, and I'm not going to mention it again. Um, the perspective that I've taken today in this talk, and also to some extent in the book, is to look at a particular aspect of anthrozoology, because I don't cover the whole thing by any means, um, which is pet keeping. Why do we have animals in our homes? And what I've tried to do, the way I've tried to think about it over the past 25 years, has been as that of an alien, to look down from a satellite and say, what are these humans doing, and why are their houses full of little furry animals? or quite big furry animals in some cases, um, why do they go out uh, at 6 a.m. and feed even larger furry animals in fields when they can't ride them because they're sick and have been sick for years? Uh, and other quirky aspects of, of uh, 21st century pet keeping. Um, so it's, it is around us, it is among us, but on the other hand, if you take a slightly more detached view, it does look a bit odd. At least um, I try to make, I mean, I've had, I have pets myself, I've had pets all my life, it isn't odd to me, but I've tried to, to generate some distance, some uh, academic distance, some intellectual distance from the subject and say, from the, from, from the, from the hobby, from the practice, and say, what is it about these things, um, which you probably hate me for saying, because they're not things, are they? They're all people, um, and I'll come on to that, uh, that, um, that, that live among us, we carry on doing it, we're still doing it. We, uh, many of us in this room are very keen to carry on doing it and are keen that other people should also do it. So what is it about human nature that makes us want to do this thing? Um, if, if I was an alien, how I would go explain this habit going back home to the government that sent me here. Um, so uh, what I need is the slide changing machine. Is that disappeared? Oh, it is. It's in a little, it's in a little stand. Thank you. Disguised. Okay. So, um, 
Well, uh, pet keeping is undoubtedly getting more and more popular. It, it shouldn't be in some senses because um, we've had a recession uh, and some economic constraints around the globe uh, in the last 10 years or so. Um, and yet um, we're continuing to keep animals. If they're not essential to our lives, then perhaps we would, you would see a downward trend. Um, and just some numbers, you know, spending in the America is twice what it was 30 years ago. That's in real terms, not in dollars. Obviously, in, in, in dollars, it's a lot more than, uh, than that. Um, here in the UK, we, got, we spend about 7 billion a year. And the big growth uh, in both countries and other parts of the world as well has been on services. So this is just a clip from, the, from a website, a business website, that says the humanization of pets is the greatest investing theme in the market. That, uh, so broadly speaking, is vets selling services um, which are much more about the relationship uh, that people have with their animals rather than simply about keeping them on their four legs walking around. Um, and, uh, and, and lots of other things as well, pet accessories, birthday presents for pets, birthday cards for pets, the whole, the whole gamut really is something that's taken off particularly in the last 15 years or so, this century. Um, so we're spending more on our pets. We may not have necessarily have a lot more money to spend overall, but the pets are still um, taking a great deal of it. What is this all about? Now, one uh, way of uh, looking at this is to say this is basically just a, a temporary blip, something that used to be very much a part of our lives. We've heard about um, uh, ritual, well, ritual slaughter, but traditional slaughter of pigs. Uh, it, it used to be part of a peasant, in inverted commas, lifestyle to have animals living in the house. Even after the Industrial Revolution, there were plenty of animals living in our cities. Um, the, the idea that animals should be kept out of cities and slaughtered somewhere quiet and over there uh, is, is a comparatively recent one, even in this country. Um, so maybe pet keeping is just something that our ancestors did, and um, there's lots of culture around it, and so we carry on doing it just as a kind of fashion that will eventually go away because there really isn't anything very much to it. Um, so we can see similar species, um, but taking on extremely different roles. So um, pigs kept in, in a, this is a simulated, um, this is the University of uh, the uh, um, Museum of Wales, I think, uh, pigs kept in a kind of uh, original early farming, Neolithic farming type of environment, um, and then the pig on the plane, the, the incident that captured the headlines about three or four years ago when somebody tried to carry a, a, a pig onto a plane and eventually got bounced off, but used existing American legislation to get the pig on there in the first place as an emotional support animal. And I think there was one involving a duck quite recently um, where somebody managed to get the duck onto the plane because they said they couldn't fly without it. Um, I think a lot of the incentive behind this is the fact that the emotional support animals travel free, whereas pet animals you have to pay lots of money for and they have to go in the holes. So um, there may be extenuating circumstances behind this. But nevertheless, um, we're using these animals, similar animals, but in extremely different ways. Now, um, there is a school of thought that says these animals are just parasites. They are just exploiting us. Um, they they do the same thing as uh, a cuckoo chick does to, in this case, a reed warbler. Um, by giving out certain signals which, to which we respond to instinctively, um, they are exploiting us. Well, I think uh, there won't be many people in this room who would, have, who would say that. Um, but uh, one of the things that tends to get trotted out is, oh, people are having pets instead of having children. That's the human analogy. And um, there is some demographic evidence to suggest that is the case, but it's not instead of, it's just before that, that there is, seems to be a habit in the West of people delaying having, or couples are delaying having children uh, for a few years, and in the meantime, they fill the gap with some kind of animal, but then they, they do go on to have children anyway. Um, so the idea that this dog is somehow a surrogate child and will prevent that couple from ever having a human baby uh, simply isn't borne out by the facts. So I think despite the fact that some of the more lurid tabloid newspapers trot this one out every now and again, I think we can, we can dispense with that one. But um, along with the tide of pro-pet, uh, I wouldn't say quite so propaganda, but there's a lot of pro-pet stuff in the news. Uh, it seems to, newspapers seem to like at the moment anyway, writing good things about dogs uh, and sometimes cats and sometimes other animals. Um, they, there is uh, unfortunate, an unfortunate tendency to over-egg the whole situation. 
So uh, I just want to deal, before I get on to the kind of main theme of the talk, I'd like to just dispel one or two of the modern myths, which some of you who are on the MA will have already perhaps dealt with, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it, this is the, basically a simple version of the theme that I go through in the book. Um, one is that pets automatically make their owners healthier, and you'll see statistics bandied around about dog owners living X years longer than people who don't have dogs and all sorts of things. And it's, there's no doubt, and there's good research, which comes, which dates right back to the beginnings of anthropology in the 1970s and 1980s, that pets do improve people's uh, cardiovascular health in the very short term. So if you sit down and stroke a dog, um, and the dog is a nice dog, and you like dogs, those are all provisos, of course, um, then your heart rate goes down, it becomes more even, your blood pressure drops, you get um, uh, release of a variety of hormones, um, including oxytocin, uh, also beta endorphin, which has been neglected somewhat in the literature, in particular in the popular press, and may actually be more important, uh, because everyone latches onto the oxytocin thing. Um, and those things, oxytocin is supposed to improve cardiovascular health, it reduces uh, cholesterol in the bloodstream, does all sorts of things. Um, and so, if you, if people, many people have measured these things over the course of a few minutes or a few hours and found beneficial effects. Not for everybody, not in every circumstance, but overall, it's, it's, a, it looks like a, uh, a benefit. But um, the uh, attempts to find that this, in, this uh, translates into an, an increased lifespan have been patchy in terms of the research. Some studies have found some an increase. Some people have found um, that pet owners actually especially cat owners, uh, those of you who like cats, sorry about this, but cat owners tend to die before uh, people who don't have cats. Um, I don't think there's any, any real uh, cause and effect in any of this, um, and I'm not going to deal with the cat thing because it may be quite complicated, but ultimately there doesn't seem to be any particular increase in lifespan. And where it has been found, there have been curious anomalies. There was a recent study done in Sweden on a very large sample, the Swedish, I don't know if there are any Swedish people here, but uh, if, they, if there are, you'll know that they're very good at collecting. It's a very well-regulated country. There is lots and lots of health uh, data uh, for every person in the country over, and collected over a very long period of time. And they found that uh, this is a research funded by the Swedish Kennel Club, I should say, um, and that may be relevant, that... Um, the dog owners in Sweden do live longer than people who don't have dogs. And they try to factor out all of the things that might have been confounding factors like income and all that sort of thing. Um, and there still seem to be a small effect, so that was good, until you break it down into breed groups. And then you find that if you've got a Labrador, you live longer um, than somebody who doesn't have a Labrador. But if you've got a Labrador cross, you die younger than somebody. So there's something else going on. Pet ownership is not simple. It's a complicated thing. It's, uh, there are many, many interactions that are going on, just as we were hearing with the therapy earlier on. Uh, there are a lot of actors in these particular situations. There are lots of, um, there are whole families. Some of the family may like the dog, others may not. Um, just because you've got a dog in your family doesn't necessarily mean you're, it may be that somebody will get a little bit healthier, but not necessarily you. It depends on your interaction with the dog and when you like dogs or not. So um, all sorts of funny things have appeared from the statistics which suggest there are actually all sorts of other things going on and that pet ownership, dog ownership in particular, because most people concentrate on dog ownership, um, uh, is, is a much more complicated and, and, and uh, difficult to measure type of, of, of phenomenon than simply saying, oh, you stroke a dog, you do it three times a day, it's kind of like a drug, you know, if you stroke a dog three times a day, you're going to live forever. Um, it, that, while some people almost seem to believe that, um, there really isn't very much evidence for it. And it isn't going to be like that anyway, because after a while, the dog's going to go, I don't want to be stroked anymore, I want to go for a walk. Uh, I want to be fed. Or um, uh, I, I don't like the postman who's come to the door and I'm going to bark very loudly and scare you. So there's lots of other things that can go on. Uh, life is just not that tidy. If you want something that tidy, get a robot dog. Uh, and then you can switch it off when the postman comes. So ultimately, um, I think the model should be pets, both reduce and increase stress. Yes, they do reduce stress in some circumstances. Um, we all have to do this nowadays, which we didn't have to do uh, when I was a, uh, first started out as being a dog owner. Um, that's not much fun, is it? You know, you, you've probably already seen the greetings cards that have come out saying, you know, the person from Mars, the, who's leading who? Is it the person who has to pick up after the dog? Is it the dog leading the person? Um, 
pets, there's well documented studies that show that pets cause family arguments. You know, somebody, one, one member of the couple is a pet uh, lover, the other one isn't, or, um, or becomes allergic, or granny comes home and, uh, to live with you, and granny doesn't like the pets, or granny does bring her pets with her, and the rest of the family don't like it. All sorts of family dynamics which are not taken into account in these rather simple models. And then, uh, and this will happen to all of them, um, the, most of the animals, I'm not talking about horses and donkeys, obviously, here, but most of these animals have much shorter lifespans than we do. Um, anyone who's a dedicated pet owner is going to have to get used to the idea that these animals are going to, several of these animals will die within their, their own lifespan, and they have to cope with the grief involved, and the grief is very real. Maybe slightly different um, from the grief that people feel for humans, but it's real nonetheless. So um, over the course of the whole lifespan and death of a pet, there's going to be all sorts of things that go on in that relationship. Some of them are going to be uh, joyful and life-promoting, and some are going to be entirely the opposite. So why do some studies find these connections? Well, um, one of the suggestions that's come from a large-scale analysis of Californian health data, this is uh, last year, is that um, well, well, a wealthy healthy, settled people uh, who live in couples um, and are not estranged from their spouses and all sorts of other things. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cultural and racial dimensions in America as well. Um, have better cardiovascular health because of their lifestyle, because they have access to med medical um, professionals, because they have access to a better diet, um, because they don't have to move around looking for work all the time, all sorts of reasons like that. Um, and those people are also in a good position to have um, pets, particularly dogs and cats, which require a certain amount of permanence, and a landlord or, uh, who's, who's sympathetic or home, own, home ownership. And so those two things may just go largely hand in hand, that, um, that pet owners uh, live longer sometimes because they are uh, in a better, they start off in a better situation, which both enables them to have a pet in the first place and also uh, uh, gives them a healthier lifestyle. And the pet may or may not contribute to that. Um, it, it can in some circumstances, perhaps not in others. Um, but in any case, this is not an evolutionary explanation, and that's really what the bulk of my talk is going to be about, is the evolutionary explanation, why I think people carry on having pets today when uh, there are a lot of logical reasons why they shouldn't. The other one I just want to have a brief touch on very briefly is that, um, again, there's quite a lot of uh, reasonably good data that shows that children who come from households with pets have better social skills, have higher self-esteem, uh, have better cognitive development than children who come from homes without pets. But, um, again, uh, with one exception, and I think I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there are some autistic children who seem to react very well to household pets. I'm not talking about therapy outside the home here. That's a different thing entirely, obviously. Um, some autistic children react very well, and there are, quite, the case history seem to be quite convincing that um, these really do cause a change, although they're very difficult to control for. Uh, anyone who's, like some people in this room who have actually worked with autistic children will know that how individualistic they are, and that just putting them under that autistic label is, um, is a gross oversimplification. So actually studying them is actually is quite difficult, um, in, in a rigorous sense anyway. But uh, there do seem to be some benefits of those kinds of therapies. But... Um, Again, it's probably mostly, most of this so-called effect of pets on children is actually, again, it's just coincidence that children who are brought up in stable households where there's a, enough money to go around um, and uh, the parents don't have to work all hours uh, and uh, do and can seek out and live in areas, pay the, pay the premium uh, for living in an area with good schools, all those things are also the sorts of uh, parents who, who are, who are going to have uh, the time and the money to have the pets. Because let's face it, it's the parent, parents who make the decision. The children may do the nagging, but it's the parents who make their minds up. Um, so, uh, again, this may just be an association with lifestyle. That lifestyle, pet keeping, and all these other things we're talking about, these rather nice outcomes, which it would be very, very nice to believe came from pet keeping, uh, may simply be more of a coincidence. The one... Corollary I would put on that, though, is that there is good evidence for, and I would uh, support the idea, that pets can teach children about animals. And I think that is one of the, the dangers of 21st century childhood, is that it's isolated from reality, that screens uh, and 
um, uh, highly um, hygienic uh, surroundings alike, so the, 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 the effect on the mind and effect on the immune system, have become so prevalent that they are, children are being taken out of the environment, the sort of environment that I grew up in, um, where I was allowed to go out and play and mess around on the local farm and play with the feral kittens and socialize, and I didn't know I was socializing, it was just fun. Um, Kids aren't allowed to do that anymore, by and large, except in some rural communities, certainly in the UK and in the United States. And uh, so I think pets are actually very valuable, both in terms of exposing uh, children to allergens, um, but also in terms of getting them to learn that, there are, that not everything is two-dimensional and brightly coloured and sings pretty songs at them, which otherwise I suspect there is a danger they would. So... Um, so I want to turn back now to the main theme, which is, you know, what is pet keeping? Um, what is it? Why do we do it? Is it something that is uh, a passing fad, uh, something that's left over from our agricultural uh, traditions and will eventually disappear as the planet becomes more congested? Well, that's a, that's a possibility, but it won't be for psychological reasons, more, more in terms of nutrition, I suspect. But anyway, um, and uh, the first thing is that um, pet keeping, despite its kind of apparently modern uh, uh, trappings today, is something which almost certainly went on tens of thousands of years ago. So when Paleolithic societies were discovered in the 19th century and early 20th century, um, they were not universally, but uh, many, many of them, a majority of them, were found to keep some kind of pet. Now, some of these pets were dogs and cats, which they'd obtained by trading, um, even though they hadn't had Western contact, but in many cases they were wild animals that were being caught. And the number of species is truly vast. Uh, there's a very interesting paper uh, which document in, in Androsoos, which documents, um, uh, summarizes all the, the literature on that. And, and there's a huge range of, of mammals, but also birds, um, and, and in some cases reptiles. Um, and uh, something like pet keeping was probably going on 50,000 years ago, if these, uh, the analogies with these societies is, is, is anything to go by. Um, clearly, we don't know whether it was going on 50,000 years ago, but um, people who were living that kind of lifestyle when they were discovered were certainly keeping pets. So we might assume, might assume that, that this was a very ancient tradition, not something that suddenly appeared by magic just before the people, the Victorian explorers or the 20th century explorers stumbled on them. These are quite complicated relationships, um, uh, and I, I don't have time to go into them all, um, but you know, the, the, the people have written whole books and, and uh, theses and so on on this subject alone. Um, so if we just take the example of the, the New Guinea um, pigs on the left. Um, these are kept as pets by, they grow up with the family, their family, they're part of the family, they grow up with the children. The women who do most of the agriculture take them out, they take the children, they take the pigs, they all go off. Uh, tending their gardens, which are sort of semi, um, uh, sort of semi horticulture in, in what is basically forest, um, until they get a bit too big, and then um, they become a nuisance, and the men take them over. And once the men take them over, they basically prepare them for ritual slaughter. And by this time, I really do mean ritual slaughter uh, in a special feast, which is a, uh, um, a custom which is used, among other things, uh, to cement relationships with neighboring villages and to, and to uh, um, keep the uh, competition between neighboring villages down. Um, and the pigs are slaughtered, and there's a massive pork fest which goes on for several days, and then everyone disappears back to their own villages, clutching their bellies, and waits for the next one, which is probably several years down the road. Um, so these are not the sorts of relationships that we have with pets today. But nevertheless, the early part of that, where the, the baby pigs are reared and uh, are brought up with the family, it, it does strike a chord. It does seem to be rather similar. Um, and this is, again, another... Uh, this is from the northern part of Japan, where... Uh, there's a, a tradition of raising bear cubs. The bear cubs are caught uh, while they're still hibernating and too dopey to do it. The mother bear's too dopey to do anything. And they're hand-raised, they're breastfed uh, by the women in the village until uh, they get a bit large and boisterous. And then again, there is a ritual slaughter um, at a particular ceremony um, and uh, the meat is consumed and the fur is used and so on. So again, there are, there are complexities here which are not part of modern day pet keeping, um, as least do as we know in the West, but there are parallels as well. 
So um, I'm going to propose three factors for why we tend to have these close relationships with animals, why we have animals in our families, essentially, rather than simply keeping them over there behind a wall, whether that wall be a physical one or whether it be a psychological one, that these are things that we use, um, the, the kind of modern agriculture model, I suppose, if you like, which, which obviously factory farming has defaulted to. But most of our relationships with animals are not like that. They're much more personal. We talk about our pets as being part of the family, uh, even on farms. Small farms, farmers will talk about the animals, they'll give them names, um, they'll become pseudo people. Um, so the three things which, that I've dug around in the literature and talked to many, many academics, been to lots of talks, I don't claim um, uh, any kind of, uh, uh, these are not my original ideas at all, and I'll mention the people who came up with them. Um, but put together, I think they explain modern pet keeping. And the first one is something which um, the uh, archaeologist Stephen Mithen at Reading University thinks happened around 50,000 years ago, um, which was the merging of different modules in the brain. Um, he proposes that until uh, that point in time, roughly, um, we had language, but language was only connected to our social intelligence. We, we had a social intelligence which was to deal with um, in relationships with other people, people in our tribe, people in the tribe over the hill who were going to come and kill us, all those sorts of things. Um, we had a, a set of, uh, we had a very deep set of knowledge or an ability to get a, a great deal of knowledge about the animals that happened to live in the part of the world where we were living because they were our food and potentially our enemies uh, if they were big and had strong teeth. And we had tool economy, tool intelligences, uh, the ability to make tools of a particular kind. But one of the remarkable things about Stone Age tool making was that it didn't change for hundreds of thousands of years, and then it seemed to suddenly blossom. And what Metton thinks happened is that this is the point at which tool intelligence merges with social intelligence. Um, now, I've, that, I, I have no comment to make on that. I'm not, not an archaeologist, uh, nor, in fact, by training, am I a psychologist. But uh, what I'm much more interested in is the merging of um, the three, but particularly the animal intelligence into the other one. So suddenly you can start thinking about animals. We could start thinking about animals as if they were people. We, and this is where I think our idea of animals as having minds first began. I, I suspect that before that, and, and also Neanderthal didn't ever evolve this, although they did survive for a bit longer, um, they saw the animals as being out there and doing stuff, but they didn't think of them as thinking, whereas we suddenly became able, our ancestors suddenly began to be able to think of animals as thinking about us, and we could think about what we think about what they're thinking, and all of that kind of stuff could start. So um, that is absolutely crucial to pet keeping. If you don't think of, of an animal as part of your family, I don't see why you would give it the, the time and attention and care that we undoubtedly do. And, of course, uh, those of you who are interested in anthropomorphism, which I kind of was for a couple of years um, because it's a, it's a fascinating subject and it's worth looking at, it's, uh, it, many people think it's the roots of superstition and therefore of religion. I mean, we talk about all sorts of things as if they had minds, even when we don't think they, are, they have. I mean, our cars, our computers, uh, the weather, the way we talk about it, at the very least, is in terms of as if there was a person somewhere or a person-like being somewhere manipulating the, the world. And of course, that is the basis of superstition. Suddenly you have gods that are um, uh, changing the world, uh, are controlling these things which we, don't, we can't control. We can't control the weather. We can't control the floods. We can't control the fires. Um, but, uh, but somebody must be. And that's what anthropomorphism is, is kind of all about. And then from there you get the basis for religion, even though you don't get any of the detail, which is largely cultural. Um, and one of the manifestations of this, there is a bit of evidence, it's not just pure speculation, is the emergence of uh, zoonotic arts. So this is a part lion, uh, part um, uh, human sculpture. It's made from mammoth ivory. It was originally all in one piece, presumably. It had to be put together after it had been discovered. That's about 35,000 years old. And to, to be, be able to, to make something, something like that, that I think Nissen says this is, the this is the evidence for the change in thinking about animals and thinking about people. Suddenly, the worlds merge together. You still know they're different. You know that a lion is not a person, but you can draw lots of parallels between them, that lions can think, and we can think. They, if we can think, so can lions. Uh, if, lion, if we behave a certain way, maybe lions can get angry or 
whatever as well, that we start imputing emotions to them and all those sorts of things. And it starts to come out in art. Um, first of all, uh, very isolated examples, but then more and more and more and more until you get all the animal symbolism that goes on in, in more modern forms of art. I don't mean modern in the modern art sense. I mean, you know, a few thousand years ago. So we saw this merging of these different intelligences. We saw that we, we begin to see anthropomorphism. And the advantage that that gave our ancestors, and it may be one of the reasons why Neanderthals went extinct, there's uh, still a lot of argument about that at the moment, is that it enables us to hunt much better. And that, I think, was the, the original advantage. Suddenly, um, we were able to outwit these animals. We didn't simply have to chase after them with the sharpest bit of stone we could find, which is kind of what used to happen before that. Um, we could actually stampede them. Uh, we could herd them in particular ways. We could hunt in much more sophisticated ways. And um, it mustn't be forgotten, at that time, uh, in this country, there were plenty of lions around and, and animals like that. Um, we could avoid the ones that wanted to kill us because we were prey as well as predator in those days. We hadn't controlled the world's fauna and it, to the extent, of course, that we have done now. So it gave us two survival advantages. It gave us more protein, more animal protein, and longer lifespans without um, having been gored uh, or, or killed by a large predator. Um, one probably led to the other, incidentally, because we got so good at hunting, we seemed to were all sorts of extinctions of these large animals, uh, which seemed to have been rather easy to kill once we'd worked out how to do it. Uh, and that probably contributed to the demise of the large carnivores, which then couldn't find enough to eat. And eventually, um, because we got even, more, even better at hunting, but I'll come to that later, to the beginnings of agriculture as a survival tactic. So that's anthropomorphism. And the second one uh, I want to look at is cuteness, which is what everybody says their pets are, don't they? Um, we, each of us means something slightly different by the word cute. And the research into what cuteness is and how people react to it is um, largely focuses on visual features of faces. That seems to be the psychologist's favorite way of looking at it. Uh, I think if you talk to people, uh, there is some research on this about what cuteness is. They'll, they'll encompass a lot more than just faces. Um, uh, Lorenz, for example, who, who uh, even who started this um, uh, idea, at least he, put it, he first crystallized it, uh, included a lot of other things, such as short, chubby limbs, playfulness, unsteady gait, all those kinds of things as aspects of cuteness. Nobody's really taken those up very much in terms of studying them, but they have studied um, the faces a lot. And um, so this uh, face is known from brain imaging studies and all sorts of things is a, is a way of uh, triggering uh, caring behavior in both men and women, just in case um, uh, there are men here who think, um, why am I not being talked about? Um, and of course, um, the, um, the same features are apparent in some pets, but not others. And there's a whole diversion I could go into, which I won't, um, about brachycephalic dogs and to some extent cats as to, you know, are we making these, is the appeal of the pug and the French bulldog, um, which we now know is detrimental to their welfare, is that to do with trying to trigger this cute response uh, uh, as more and more and more intensely? Well, I think the, the, it almost certainly is. But of course, there are quite a lot of dogs which have long noses uh, and don't look cute in the baby sense. And so I think there is, and I'll have to admit, you know, there isn't much research into what the cuteness value of those animals is, um, but, uh, but some of them, and certainly puppies and kittens, have a lot of these baby attributes which trigger um, uh, this kind of behavior. Now, if, if we go, just go back to the cuckoo hypothesis, I mean, are these animals simply triggering Cute, uh, cute reactions that should be, uh, evolutionarily speaking, reserved for human babies and therefore possibly ethically speaking as well. Um, well, um, the brain imaging studies suggest uh, yes and no. There are a lot of areas of the brain that pictures of cute kittens and pictures of cute babies trigger almost identically. Um, but then there are a few, with the ones which I've um, outlined here in red, which respond um, only to uh, babies and don't respond to animals. So um, there are some parts that there, there is some selection going on. Um, our brains, even at this very instinctive kind of looking at a picture and, and reacting within milliseconds, know that this is not the human baby and some bits of it are not going on. And then there are other parts, other brain scanning studies, which show that there are lots of other parts of the brain that only respond to animal images and don't respond to human images at all. 
So there's lots of uh, at least possibilities anyway for uh, us to be able to uh, modulate these responses. We're using common machinery, if you like, for, the, for kittens and for babies, but there are enough differences between them for us to at least have the potential to know perfectly well, which we do consciously, of course, but also at a kind of instinctive caring level um, that uh, th this is not uh, a human baby. Um, the second thing that I think is, is, is going to come in um, here is, uh, is the, well, sorry, the, the, the second part of this is the caregiving aspect of it. Um, that's cute animals make us want to take care of them. This was an interesting experiment done, uh, not, not widely reported. Uh, it was done in a, um, an orphanage in Germany not long after World War II, where the children, for economic reasons, I guess, were kept in a very... Uh, isolated and um, regimented environments, and one of the things that were there were no animals. So a German psychologist thought this would be, it would be interesting simply to confront these children with animals to see what they did with them, when they'd never seen an animal, never touched an animal before, as far as he knew. And uh, there were also, it's a, it's a long, one of these long kind of 1960s rambling papers, because it was 20 years before he got to write it up. Um, but because uh, he confronted them with snakes and all sorts of things, um, which, uh, conf which induced all sorts of very different reactions. But when he gave them kittens, um, even the boys picked them up and cradled them as if they were babies. There was some sort of almost instinctive. They didn't, didn't have to learn it. They hadn't imitated. They weren't imitating their parents. Um, they were. They seemingly just knew what to do. And this uh, caregiving thing, um, I guess, has reached its, its climax, if you like, in the Tamagotchi and similar robotic type of pets, which I suppose they're round, so that in that sense they're cute, but otherwise I don't think they're particularly cute. Um, they make horrible little bleeping noises and tell you that they need to do all sorts of things which they don't actually need to do, but you know you have to do press the right buttons to make them go to the toilet or they explode. And um, you know, I, I don't see the appeal, but nevertheless, very, very appealing um, to, to adolescents. And this is just pure caregiving. There's nothing coming back. These things do not disgorge anything other than um, leaping noises and peer pressure, I guess, um, where, you know, uh, little, little so-and-so has let her Tamagotchi, her pet, as they call them, die. Uh, isn't she a bad person? So there's, a, there's some of that. But I suspect it, that that's only part of it. That the actual caregiving aspect is very important. And it shows that it's, um, uh, the feedback is very strong. So the caregiving thing, the cuteness, that's all part of it. And then thirdly, I think it's the tactile side of it, which is the bit that um, I, I guess I've uh, perhaps had the most to do with in terms of, of working out what might be going on. Now, why do we find uh, stroking fur rewarding? It's known that um, even teddy bear fur, plush fabric, causes um, the, the, so, the same sorts of reactions, not to the same extent, but to, the, to a similar extent, both in terms of hormonal changes and in terms of uh, psychology, making people relax and feeling more open about things um, that, that, uh, than stroking an animal does. Where did this come from? Why do we find this so appealing? We are hairless beings, most mainly. Um, so you'd think after a few, few uh, hundreds of thousands of years of not having fur that we would have lost our desire to stroke it, but we do. And of course, uh, going further back, going back um, you know, millions of years into our primate past, um, maybe five million years, um, this kind of behavior, this, this, or this uh, mutual grooming behavior, is incredibly important. It's important for hygienic reasons, yes, but it's mostly important for social reasons. This is the way that most ape and monkey societies bond themselves together. This is the glue that holds them together. The, the, the ones that don't participate in the grooming are the ones that are going to be kicked out. Um, whether which is cause and which is effect, uh, you know, varies a little bit between different species and societies and so on. But uh, if you can see these animals grooming, you know that they're friends. And they do an awful lot of it. They spend as much time as they possibly can doing it, basically, when they're not having to eat, either eat or sleep. Um, so uh, this is something that's there in our primate past. We mustn't forget um, that we're primates. So um, this should all have been, this should have been selected out. In fact, the whole lot should have been selected out. Giving care to animals that don't um, give us anything back. Um, okay, you might want to care for your pig because you're going to eat it, but giving care to a dog or a cat that isn't going to, uh, you're not going to eat, why would you do that? Um, the should, the, uh, and the, the whole business of confusing animal minds, of thinking about um, animals as if they were people and vice versa, 
Basically, they're all false in, in the long run, if you take a very dispassionate view of them. Uh, I'm not saying they're false. I'm just saying if you were a Martian looking down at it, you'd say, well, what are these humans doing? They just don't know what they're doing. They've confused uh, a variety of things. They should have moved on uh, in the kind of, um, you know, Dr. Spock, uh, the, the Star Trek model. Because there are lots of things that pet keeping, particularly not in modern societies, but in ancient societies, would have been bad news. Um, there's a nutritional cost. Some of these animals can feed on scraps. Others have to be, and often are, brought to very special food. In fact, sometimes they're fed specially even when they don't need to be as, as, as a part of a cultural thing. Um, and in some parts of the world, indeed, um, there is, uh, the, the animals are not treated well. Um, and, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, there's also, and perhaps even more seriously, the zoonotic thing. Um, we've heard today a bit about um, the, the badger TB, the badger cattle TB earthworm history story. Um, well, uh, that, that's something that affects us, um, obviously, at, at arm's length, so to speak, but, it, um, but in, uh, further back than that, having animals around um, in your village would have exposed you to all sorts of viruses and bacteria and other infections that you would not, and, and parasites, intestinal parasites, which otherwise you would have been able to avoid. Uh, in fact, one of the, the, the things that... that um, uh, people who, who discovered pet keeping societies found was that there was there was a burden. Um, the monkey keeping societies in, in the Amazonia, for example, um, uh, keeping with the theme of TB, uh, they found that the TB was endemic among those societies, and one of the reasons it was en was endemic, uh, and they couldn't get rid of it, was because all the monkeys had it too, and they wouldn't put the monkeys down. They literally, they carry, the women particularly, carry monkeys around with them wherever they go. So the chances of eradicating TB were basically zero. Um, so uh, overall, I think that there, are co there are costs which should have selected out pet keeping. It should have been selected out long, long before we got uh, to this room. Um, and we shouldn't be talking about this at all if the human race was entirely logical, which of course we're not. So if if you're an evolutionary biologist and you've discovered a problem with something which should have been selected out, then you need to uh, think about some um, other factors which might have counterbalanced that, in fact, have uh, done exactly the opposite to cause um, the, a positive selection for a particular trait. And uh, one that um, uh, I was writing a paper a few years ago with Elizabeth Paul, who's a colleague of mine at Bristol, a uh, psychologist there, and we came up with the idea that it could have been a form of sexual selection, that one way of uh, choosing um, marriage partners would be uh, to look at the caregiving abilities of the opposite sex. So it could be the male, it could be the female. Now, in, with modern ideas of romantic love where people go and pick their own partners, that doesn't seem to make very much sense because you're immediately saying, well, I didn't pick my partner because he was good with dogs. Maybe you did, but it probably doesn't happen all that often. Um, there's a lot of smiles going on around the room, so I'm very pleased to see. Uh, but um, uh, in most of these societies, at least the surviving ones, people do not choose their spouses. Their spouses are chosen by the parents. And they're chosen for a number of reasons, um, of which anthropologists have kind of emphasized particularly the strategic ones. So you, um, you marry somebody from the, the adjacent village so that you've always, wherever, you are, wherever you're living, you're surrounded by distant relatives, at least, which reduces, they think, probably, and, and the people say, reduces the, um, the, the likelihood of warfare going, breaking out between, conflicts breaking out between the neighboring societies. Um, and I'm sure that's true, but, uh, but that still gives the, um, so you, you have to choose somebody from the neighboring village anyway. The, the village is further away, probably too far to go anyway. Um, so what else do you use to try and find a nice husband for your daughter or vice versa? And maybe the ability to look after animals would be a good one because it's proxy, it would be a good proxy for, for being good with kids, particularly for men. And this may be the reason why um, we get this phenomenon. Now, this is something in anthropology which I've been fascinated by for years and never been able to explain, um, but I think maybe this is why. This is this trustworthiness thing. People with dogs, and the research is all about dogs, so I don't know about other animals, um, are, seem to be more trustworthy than, uh, appear more trustworthy than people without. And this experiment was done in France where a guy uh, had a, a dog uh, and, um, or didn't have a dog and, and was asking girls for a, their telephone numbers. Um, and he got, a, he got a lot more telephone numbers um, when he had the dog than when he didn't. 
Um, but uh, there's, they, uh, this is just, that's just one study, but there's lots of other studies using completely different methodologies that uh, back it up. For example, there's a kind of um, dating website uh, experiment where a fictitious man was put on to see how many uh, contacts he would get from women. And there were two of them, and the descriptions and the pictures were identical. The only thing that was different, and, and both of them seemed to be actually not that nice, really quite selfish people, um, kind of, you know, not being terribly blatant about it, but there were little, tr little clues in the description that said this guy is not a, actually a great catch. He likes to go to football all the time, and he's probably not got very much money, and a few things like that. And then they added, so one of the descriptions they added, and he's got a dog. And the one with the dog gets 10 times as many hits on the internet. So um, there is something very trust-promoting about this, and it's something which has been, been discovered, but not necessarily overemphasized in animal-assisted therapy. That one of the ways that animal-assisted therapy may work, and I, it's my favorite reason for why it works, is that it doesn't re the animal is just a conduit. It's building a bridge between um, the, the person who's receiving the therapy and the therapist, whether that person be male or female. All these experiments have tended to be done with men um, and women responding. But uh, the, the, the therapist is just more approachable. And what these people, the people who are receiving the therapy, very often are craving is human contact. But they have inhibitions. We all have inhibitions about what we can say to the people uh, in, in different situations. Uh, the dog helps to break those down and makes the, uh, the whole thing go much more smoothly. So it's, that is the magic, if you like. That's the magic of pet therapy, in my, in my opinion, in many cases anyway. The dog is not really doing anything other than giving the person who's doing the therapy a very different kind of image than if that same person was uh, just trying to do the therapy alone. So, selection for pet keeping, part two is animal domestication, which was a massive change in human society. And of course, the first animal to be domesticated was dogs, so we can try and concentrate on that. Everything else follows, although I'll try and, um, and justify that as well. Now, the problem of domestication, one which, again, I've, I've uh, studied domestication um, in various ways for many, many years, and the problem I've always come across is, why did it take so long? Uh, and you, you can, can domesticate, domesticate animals very quickly. I mean, the, the, the um, Siberian fur fox experiment shows that. You can domesticate animals in about 50 generations. Um, but only if you've got barbed wire and scientists to, and, and people who understand genetics. Um, Paleolithic societies, Neolithic societies weren't like that. They were much more chaotic. They didn't have any science. They didn't have any barbed wire. Uh, how on earth was the wolf ever domesticated? And that's a problem that people spent whole conferences arguing about. Um, so uh, the, 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 the nitty-gritty is that it must have taken many, many generations of humans. Somehow, you've got to preserve this very fragile genetic stock, which is your new, your proto-dog coming from a wolf, or your proto-cat coming from a wild cat, or a proto-horse uh, coming from a wild horse. Um, you've got to somehow keep it separate and keep it breeding separately um, for many generations before you can uh, transform it into something which is actually easy to handle. Why would you want to do that, and how would you do it? But it's a fact that societies with domestic animals have outcompeted those with none. I mean, there is another strategy, which is to go and steal your neighbors. Uh, but you can't do that until your neighbors have achieved this particular thing. So that has to be a secondary one. Um, and the, the first animal to be domesticated, as I said, was, uh, we all know, I mean, the DNA evidence proves it pretty much in con uh, conclusively now, is, is, the dog, is the wolf turning into the dog. Why was that such an advantage? Why did that stick? Um, well, one answer could be that it didn't to begin with. I mean, there are sort of doggish remains from around 30,000 years ago, which people argue about whether they were dogs or whether they were just a funny kind of wolf which happened to die near a person. Um, uh, because, because the, the, the archaeological evidence is very fragmented and there are great big gaps that go on for thousands of years with no dogs whatsoever. And where are they? If, you know, if, if we had dogs that long ago, there should be more. Um, and you don't get consistent uh, uh, evidence for domestic dogs until about 15,000 years ago. Um, and then after that, it's continuous. So maybe some of the early domestications of dogs did fail. But... They must have gone some, I think, gone some, down some route, and eventually um, they, they were successful, as I said, around perhaps 20 to 15,000 years ago. 
what was the reason why these dogs were so successful? And I think initially it was to do with guarding, because you can't hunt with a dog until you've domesticated it, because you can't train it until you've domesticated it. But then once we had got some domestic dogs, suddenly people who could hunt with dogs were so much more successful than people who, who weren't. That dog keeping, the, the, the art and science, well, not much science, but the art of dog keeping it would have then spread. The ability to do it would have then spread um, uh, alarmingly fast because tribes, societies with dogs had competed those with none. And, but to do that, you've got to isolate the genetic stock. You can't have your proto-dogs interbreeding with wolves all the time. Otherwise, the domestic genes, whatever they happen to be, the domestic forms of the genes, I should say, for the geneticists here, the, the, gen the alleles that promote um, domestication and tameness and bonding with people, um, could only have thrived, I think, if these were personal animals. Uh, because that's the only way you can keep a proto-dog away from a wolf. Um, they, you have to keep them in with you. you have to, they have to live with you to protect those genes for tameness. And then, then the other side of that would be, uh, so that prevents the breeding with the wild ancestor, but also it prevents uh, when you are, your tribe runs out of food, everybody turning around and saying, let's kill the dogs and eat them, which may seem horrendous to you, but if, you, if you're starving, maybe that's the, only, you know, that's, that's the only course you've got. If those dogs were just tools, like a stone axe or whatever, then why not? What's the, what's the barrier to it? If they're, person, if they're people, if they're little members of the family or big members of the family, then that's a barrier. You're actually killing somebody's brother or sister or whatever it might be, whatever the analogy might be. Um, and that, I think, was, would also have promoted um, these, the retention of these genes. Because if you eat all your dogs, you have to start again with a wolf or, or, or find another society which has kept dogs and then barter for them. Um, so uh, these things would all have happened. There would have been all sorts of glitches that took place. But I think the idea that an animal is personal uh, is the thing that kept domestication going, however falteringly, and eventually it allowed us to end up first with dogs and then, by analogy, with lots of other kinds of animals as well. But I'll be the first to admit, um, you know, from an evolutionary psychology point of view, you should have a kind of single answer to everything. Well, of course, pet keeping is incredibly diverse. Um, different cultures have different animals and treat them in very different ways. And so I'd be the first to admit to say, this is cultural. This is all cultural, this stuff, all the detail of it. What kind of animal you have, how you treat it um, in, with, within certain constraints anyway. Um, uh, how you think about it is, is determined a lot by what you inherit from the, I don't mean genetically, I mean in, uh, culturally, from the environment around you, including your parents and your siblings and every, everything else, um, and what you get from culture. So this is some work of Hal Herzog's, uh, where he's traced the influence of particular films in America um, on the, the popularity of particular breeds. So the there was a film called The Shaggy Dog, which I don't recall, I think it must have been popular in America, um, in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, suddenly everyone wants an old English sheepdog because Shaggy Dog was uh, an old English sheepdog. Um, and then the popularity went down again. Um, and interestingly, that went on until about the 1980s and then disappeared. But maybe that's to do with the fragmentation of the media, that not everyone's going to see the same film at the same time. You know, everyone's watching stuff on Netflix from three years ago. And so the, the trends are, are um, well, the, the, the fashion things are, are less coming from films and more from film stars and uh, celebrities and so on, hence uh, French bulldogs and pugs. Um, so the kinds of dogs that, that Japanese, I did quite a lot of cross-cultural work with uh, Japanese attitudes to dogs and um, the kinds of dogs that, that people have in Japan have changed dramatically from these traditional breeds um, to much more to, to a much greater popularity of Western breeds, so sort of so-called cocoa colonization. Um, so, the, and that's just, that's just variation within one species. If we just stick with this one and the vegans sort of look away, sorry, I should have warned you about this one. This is, uh, again, this is a, a, a Eastern, um, Far Eastern attitude uh, to another Far Eastern attitude towards dogs, which is that certain kinds of dogs are food animals. They're not, they're not the same breeds as pet animals, but this is a dog butcher in a market in, in, in Korea. Um, so there is, you know, there is a, a tremendous variation culturally in what you can do with this particular animal. Um, but the majority of it, has to be said, um, is affectionate. Um, and it's just, that's a subject I deal with one of my other books in, in Defense of Dogs. Um, 
One, One of the things, things that we discovered, um, uh, and, and along with Elizabeth Paul and a guy called James Serple, who the anthropologists among you will, um, have, have, will know well, if you, even if you haven't met him, um, is that uh, pet keeping runs in families. And this was thought to be a cultural phenomenon um, when they did their research, and I uh, agreed with them. Um, I did some research, for example, for the American military into um, the, the, what is the ideal dog handler. Uh, if you're going to recruit a bunch of, of military people uh, and you're going to choose which ones become dog handlers, how do you do it? What psychometric tests do you use? Sorry about that. Um, that's what we were using. That's what they use. And um, one of the things we, we looked at, well, obviously, were the characteristics of existing dog handlers, the good ones. What are the, the good ones? So the ones who are enjoying it and are successful, uh, how do they compare with the ones who want to get out of it and aren't very good at their jobs? Um, and one of the things we could not find any variation in was in pet keeping. Every single, I think, well, 90 something, 95 plus percent of the dog handlers that we profiled had had a dog when they were a kid. That's what qualifies you to be, that's what makes you want to be a dog handler, apparently. You might not be very good at it, but it motivates you. So the whole idea was that we said, oh yeah, dog, dog keeping runs in families, it's a tradition, um, it's all cultural. And then a piece of research came along um, that uh, showed uh, something rather different. Um, just, but just, sorry, I've, I've gone ahead of myself. Um, it is also associated with wider empathy for animals, so maybe a general trait, um, which is again is the theme I deal with in the book. Um, but, uh, and it also seems to have other rather far-reaching effects. So as part of this cross-cultural research, we started looking at attitudes towards dogs um, uh, and uh, whether people, um, uh, just drawing as we, as we do, we academics do, uh, drawing subjects from the students around us and making them sit, stay five minutes after a lecture and fill in a questionnaire. Um, and I said to the student, look, uh, I really think we all need to get you know, a broad spectrum. Okay, we're only dealing with 18 to 21 year olds. That's just inevitable. But let's go to lots of different degree courses uh, in different kinds of colleges around the area, just so we get, just in case there's some variation. And the thing that sprung out of us was that people doing life sciences, uh, whether in Japan or in the UK, were much, had far more pets during their childhood than people doing management studies in economics. Um, something about the pet keeping family seems to have an effect on what kind of higher education you do, which is which was an unexpected result. So these are, there's some, there's some quite deep underlying things here which I, I wouldn't propose to know a great deal about, but they emerge statistically in lots of different studies, uh, not just mine. The study that kind of turned these things slightly on their heads, which again hasn't received a great deal of publicity, and there's only one study, so who knows if it'll be replicated, but if it is, um, and it is being replicated as we speak uh, in New Zealand. Uh, it's, that, uh, it's a tr classic twin study where you look at the differences between identical and fraternal twins to see how much they like animals. And this was just one question in the questionnaire. How much do you, would you like to go and play with a dog today? Or something like that. And um, so to the people's surprise, they found that um, childhood experience was, had no measurable effect at all contrary to everything I've just told you. It's not childhood experience. It's parent, parental genetics. So your parents would have had, if, you, if you're an animal lover, your parents probably had genes which predisposed them to be animal lovers. They may not have had an animal. They may not have had, have had the circumstances to do so. They may have had a problem. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they were highly successful pet keepers, but their genes pushed them in that direction, and they will push you in the same direction. Um, and the rest of it uh, was probably adult experience. I mean, that is actually the error term, if, if you're interested in the statistics, um, because uh, every person in that study, they were uh, veterans of the Vietnam War that were being followed up um, uh, for all sorts of purposes. Uh, and they were all men, they were all pretty much all Caucasians, so the sample's not exactly representative. Um, so uh, but adult experience of animals seems to be the other reason, the main reason, in fact, two thirds of the variation in it was to do with um, uh, what kinds of, apparently due to what kinds of experiences you've had with animals, which I think is what we'd expect. You know, people, everyone has a different set of experiences. Some will be positive, some will be negative. Just to give you some context, um, this is not too dissimilar to the, the heritability of personality. Again, uh, the model says, probably around 5% is childhood experience, and that tends to apply to people who've had very poor childhoods. Um, 
Most people's personalities are not that affected by the way they were brought up. Sorry, Mr. Freud. Um, but uh, genetics plays a large part, perhaps a slightly larger part. These numbers are probably um, you know, not that accurate anyway for the, for the pet keeping. Um, and adults experience 55% of adult personality. So, uh, and a lot of that's to do with adolescence, um, incidentally, if, you, if you're not familiar with the research. So, so pet keeping may be as heritable as personality. Um, is, is the bottom line, I guess, there, which makes, uh, opens up a whole load of things which um, uh, uh, kind of go along with the idea of um, pet keeping being an evolved trait. Because if it is evolved, you should see some variation. There are lots of different strategies for getting animals, and they don't all involve loving them. Some of them involve stealing them, for example. Um, and so, uh, you know, Genghis Khan left, uh, has left 10 million uh, descendants or something. I don't think he loved animals. Um, he probably loved his horse. Uh, or quite a lot of horses in succession. But um, uh, there are other ways of getting animals than um, uh, you can get them by raiding as well as by looking after them for the, their entire lifespan. So you will get variation. I think you predict that. But you have, to get, you have to have people who love animals for there to be domestic animals in the first place. So that gene will also survive. Um, so, uh, again, um, I've made one reference to Hal Herzog already, so I'll make another one just in case he's listening, because this is being streamed um, over the, around the world, apparently. Um, pet keeping is not universal. Uh, if you look at the anthropological literature from Africa in particular, you find it's not that common, and that um, when it does go on, it doesn't seem to be the kind of affectionate pet keeping that we know. There are animals around. Um, but they're not quite treated in the way that we would like to treat our pets in some societies. Not all of them, but um, it, pet keeping does seem to be something which happens in the rest of the world. And maybe that's to do with mankind, our species, evolving in Africa, but then changing the way its brain worked after leaving Africa. I don't know, um, but it just seems to, doesn't seem to be an observation. But I always have to be careful to say it's not human nature. Human nature would be something that is absolutely universal, uh, and it's not that. There's a lot of cultural variation in the detail. Um, but variation within cultures where everybody, you know, people have, two people have had roughly the same experiences and roughly the same opportunities to look after pets of a particular kind, to obtain pets of a particular kind, have the knowledge to do so. Um, there seems to be some underlying genetic variation, which I think is uh, ripe for a lot more investigation um, to see really how that works. And indeed, you know, how, what are the mechanisms behind you, you can say there's a gene for it, you can show something's heritable. That doesn't tell you anything about how those genes are working. They could be working in all sorts of uh, convoluted and roundabout ways. But I do think um, that, the, uh, that modern pet keeping allows uh, the expression of, of some previously adaptive behaviors, things which don't really make much evolutionary sense today, but almost certainly did 10,000 years ago. Uh, one is grooming which we still like to do, uh, even though we've lost all, we lost all our hair hundreds of thousands of years ago, or most of it. Um, and the other one is looking after animals, uh, as opposed to looking after people. We know the difference, but we choose to look after animals. And I think we continue to look after animals, because it's something that actually um, stood us in, in great stead in the past, uh, and it's just, so it's just a piece of, inf of, of hum human evolution that we like to continue to express. And some people would say, well, yeah, but... You know, animals are taking up too much in the way of resources. We should try and, try and phase it out, shouldn't we? Well, there's an argument for that. I mean, there's an argument, you know, how are we going to feed cats in the 22nd century? They're obligate carnivores. They have to have meat. There's a, there's a technological solution, I'm sure, but it needs to be debated. But uh, on the positive side, I would point to the, all the research which shows that um, Pet keeping is linked to empathy. It's link, linked to empathy for animals. So people who have pets and people whose parents had pets are much more likely to contribute to animal welfare charities. They're much more likely to visit zoos. They're, they're, and also, they're much more likely to be interested in animal conservation and to contribute to charities uh, and organizations that promote animal conservation. So I don't think, I think our pet versus wild animal uh, dichotomy, which particularly the cat lovers stroke and haters love to make so much of, is actually a false dichotomy in some senses, that um, they're, it's, we're, they're part of a continuum. That animals can help us, pet animals can help us to learn about real animals, especially in a world which is increasingly dominated by technology, um, and, Mike, and uh, Apple in particular, um, and, uh, and that um, they enable us to interact with uh, 
and understand much more really about what is actually going on out, out there yeah, in the wild, um, which obviously needs to be topped up with other kinds of knowledge because a domestic cat is not a lion. But they're similar enough, I think, to be very useful for educational purposes. Uh, and I think promotion of pet keeping um, can be done positively, uh, that it's not a destructive, narcissistic, selfish habit. That it's actually just part of loving the planet uh, and wishing the planet to continue uh, roughly as it is now. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Um, I, for the purposes of that, because we are being streamed online, we don't know how many people are watching where they are, but they would like to hear your questions. So I will hand around the mic for anyone who has a question. Yes. Thank you very much. That was really, yeah, very well explained on some very, very complicated <laughs> topics. Um, I've got a ridiculous amount of questions I've made notes on, so I'm going to have to um, try and keep them concise. Um, yeah, uh, I d I want, one thing was... Um, oh, I've got so many questions. Uh, the cuteness response um, you spoke about. I don't, are you aware of um, Kate Marks's work? on the cute response in the Appalachian Trail. I'm sorry, no, I didn't quite catch. Uh, Kate Marks, she's doing, I think, it's on, is that on Sunday? She's talking about that. Um, so last year I, I came to the residential and she presented that. And um, she's looking at the um, cute response to, what, how do you pronounce it? Alla Appalachian Trail, I think it is. And um, of blog, I think it's on blogs, people's blogs, and their cute re their response to animals on the trail. And um, she brought up some of the topics that were like things that were not cute and not usually considered cute, but people in their blogs were referring to these things as cute, like a, um, bears and snakes and things that you wouldn't think are cute, but they'd have that response. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I think there's, um, there, there is a, a, a uh, deficiency in the research in that psychologists are really only interested in the cute response, I suspect, because of the way uh, to, to help them to understand maternal infant bonding. Because, mm. I mean, that is a big problem, you know, that mothers who do not feel the love they're expecting to feel for their infants. And so there's... Um, a great deal, and the infants, you know, there's research that says those infants don't do as well as ones who do get, the, whose mothers do feel it. So um, there's a lot of focus on that, and there's been a lot of focus on, um, on the faces because it's a very convenient experimental paradigm. You just show people photographs of baby faces, and you can tweak the eyebrows slightly, and you can get significant results. So it's, you know, it's a good way of turning out theses, if you like. So... Um, yeah, I think there's been an overemphasis on that. I think there's lots of other um, uh, aspects of cuteness that uh, probably do trigger quite instinctive reactions. There is another aspect of it, though, which is there's a learned aspect. There's a study done in Australia with different dogs, of different uh, of people's own dogs. And they were asked to rate their own dog for cuteness and then five other dogs for cuteness, that were, uh, which were also owned by other members of the other people who were subjects in the study. And the own dogs, no matter how, what their average ranking for cuteness was, were always rated higher by their owners as cuter than everybody else did. So the cutest dogs were super cute and the really ugly dogs were kind of cute if, they were, if you were talking to the owners. So there's a learned... This may be a language problem. I mean, I think there are quite a lot of language problems. I think that's where anthrozoology can make a major contribution if it wants to, which is in producing, and, I, and uh, academics shouldn't produce new language for things, but I think because it just confuses the public. But <clears throat> I think here's a genuine issue. There is this word cute, which means too many different things, uh, and, and it could be pulled apart a bit better, I think. There's members of the family, which emerged from some uh, research um, done in America where somebody thought of asking people that question and 85% of people did and then if you compare it with other research where which has been open-ended people have gone in and said I want to talk to you about the, the re relationships you have in your family um, very few people in include animals they just don't talk about them in the, that way um, if they're not prompted to do so now, there may be a cultural thing um, you know these things are these are different studies done in different places but again, you know, the member of the family thing, I suspect, is a little bit um, 
it's, it's confusing. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there are many aspects of this which we don't have sufficiently good language because our ancestors were not anthrozoologists. It's great that people have got multiple questions, but let's, uh, let's bring over here to Angela. Thanks, John. That was fascinating. I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are on what would be the evolution of domestication in livestock and food animals and whether you think it's the same kind of process or a related one or something rather different? I think it's uh, a mixture. I think there are some, I mean, I think it, it's, it depends on where you stand, where, where you look in history. So if we're talking about domest recent domestications like um, uh, antelope in Africa, that's all very cognitive. That's about taking a model that uh, we know applied to cattle because we've read about it and applying it to another species. So that is, nothing, is not like what I was describing at all. Uh, I would say it was 100% cultural. Um, the, the, the one that I've had a look at um, in particular was the pig, which took about 5,000 years to domesticate. And there was a massive in, interbreeding. It's one of the problems with pig genetics. I, I don't know if you know the literature, but um, <clears throat> pig DNA is, uh, is, is weird because the, uh, and it took them a very long time to look at the different breeds of pig from different parts of the world and try and work out what the sequence of domestication was. And the reason for that was that it was a, a really coherent domestication done in Asia, where they seem to have, uh, Western Asia and the Near East, um, where they seem to have isolated populations quite well from the, wild, from the wild boar. And then farmers started taking these pigs up into Europe, and they interbred so much with the local wild boar that it looks like a separate domestication until you crunch the numbers in a slightly different way and get more samples and all that stuff. So there's been a long debate in the DNA literature about it. Uh, and I think there's a consensus emerging now. There's a guy called Gregor Larson at Durham, who's um, well, is he now at Durham. He keeps moving around. Anyway, um, he's, he's done a lot of this research and um, uh, tried to, you know, and pieced it all together. And so it looks as if this interbreeding thing with the wild stock was a genuine phenomenon that, that um, and that probably, although there's no evidence for it nowadays, because there can't be, we lost a lot of domesticated stock. They went off, they mated with wild boar, they were the same species, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Uh, and because they were mate, th their offspring were wilder than the mothers, because it would usually be the mothers, um, then, uh, then gradually the domestication petered out. But in that instance, of course, there was the original Asiatic stock to go back to. So literally, they were traded up, back up into Europe again over a course of several thousand years. I mean, that's the remarkable thing. It didn't just happen once. You'd think, you know, domestication, well, once you've got there, you've got there, you've got your pigs, you've got the, you know how to handle them. They're so valuable to you. Obviously, you know, from the things we've heard about today, these societies value their pigs incredibly highly. Um, you'd think that was a done and dusted, but it, that's not the way it was. It was very, very convoluted, uh, and uh, it stuttered and started and stopped. So I think that is... It's part of those early domestications, but not part of the later ones. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, go back to the cute question once more. I mean, you've stuck to a fairly kind of uh, evolutionary argument throughout your talk. Um, however, when you showed these images, you showed the image of the baby next to, a, I think it was a cute kitten or a cute doggy or something like that. Don't you think that those are very kind of European or Euro-American traits that we associate with pets? You, you talked about, um, um, is it pugs or uh, these dogs and th that look very cute? But if we look in other, other societies, is there, is there much evidence that people were, um, were kind of uh, modifying animals uh, for those kind of cute traits? Because, I mean, if you look at the dingo or something in Australia, it's totally different. Wild, um, the, the kind of hunting dogs that we use all across the world. Um, I'm, I'm, in my head, I'm trying to think of some examples of cute animals. I, the only one I can think of is that kind of the Chinese kind of lion dog, but that's a mythological mm. uh, kind of species, if you like, in a way. Anyway, I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think there, there are... The cuteness, I, mean, I think it goes back to this idea of, of we find lots of things cute about these animals and the research doesn't address the reality too well. I mean, some of the psychological research, literally, they use 
they, they, if you read the methodology, you'll find that they're interspersing pictures of human babies and kittens, and for some of them, they're actually using pictures of kittens as analogies for human babies, as if they were the same. Um, cuteness seems to apply, as, as Lorentz, you know, kind of originally characterized, um, before the whole thing went off into faces. It, it characterizes a whole load of, of attributes of young animals, and that um, there certainly has been, in terms of the brain imagery work, um, it, it, it's been done on Afro-Americans, for example, um, and they have the same responses. Uh, so it's not a, it, there's no kind of racial bias or anything like that. But that's, that's the same culture, though, isn't it? Afro-America is uh, no, but... It's in America, it's America. Basically. Yes, okay. I mean, it, it, well, yeah, there isn't a, lot, a great deal of research. I mean, there is some research, well, I think there's one paper that I can recall that, that looks at um, changes in uh, brain uh, um, activity, uh, differences between people in brain activity in rela relation to how cute they find things, and there are differences. So there is, there is some variation there. Um, but again, it's, it's all within this narrow context of showing people photographs of faces. And I think what we need is, is, is a much broader approach to the whole loads of, loads of different stimuli. But the appeal of young animals is universal and goes over, across lots of other species, hence the adoptions that people can work on in zoos and so on. Yeah, uh, yeah I, think, I think that I fully agree with you there. But what I mean is, uh, surely then we could look for a cultural explanation, not necessarily evolutionary particularly when your people are breeding animals for certain I'd say the American society cut down Japan as well it wasn't traditionally Japanese well I think I agree that the, the well the phenomenon of the flat faced dog is not modern I mean it, they were, people were breeding flat faced dogs 4,000 years ago in China Right. Uh, the Pekingese, the original Pekingese. I mean, whether that's the ancestor of the modern Pekingese, but they looked similar from the drawings that were made. So I think the appeal of that has um, is there, has been there all along. I think it's showing itself much more now due to two things. One is that people don't want functional dogs anymore, other than com than company. And the second one is the internet, where the idea of well, and advertising, um, where these dogs have just in the last few years have been used intensively in advertising, again, which, which is now you know, the British Veterinary Association trying to clamp down on uh, because of the detrimental effect it's having on, on, uh, on the dogs themselves. Um, but uh, also in terms of celebrity endorsements of these very small dogs, not all of which have flat faces, but the flat face thing does seem to, to come through. Uh, and, but, but there's, yeah, the psychology of us, that even that I think is more complex. Um, there's a guy called uh, Peter, uh, Peter Sando in, in Denmark who's um, suggested that there's a kind of Munchausen by proxy thing going on here, that people actually take on dogs that can't breathe properly because it makes them feel more caring. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but there's, there's something, there may be something like that going on because people describe the snuffling that brachycephalic animals make as cute. So, yeah, there's a lot of flavors of cuteness and they're not all good ones. Um, thank you. I'd just be interested in your thoughts on, there seems to be a growth in keep, or pet keeping of less tame uh, breeds, so the hybrids, the Bengals, savannas for cats and wolf dogs, um, and how that sort of relates to pet keeping in general. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree there's, there's a, there is a trend uh, towards it. I suspect um, it's... Well, I mean, the, the, I mean, you're from Cats Protection, so I'll deal with the Bengals first. I think the Bengals thing is uh, people don't very often repeat, has been my experience, is that Bengals look absolutely gorgeous. People want this kind of wild cat. Then they get one, uh, and they realize what a nightmare they are, um, most of them. Um, you know, they, they charge around the furniture, knock things over, terrorize the neighbor's cat. Um, we, when, when I did the, one of the Cat Watch programs for the BBC, we had a couple of Bengals with those radio collars on. Um, and they're not, I mean, they're not domestic cats, they're hybrids, as you say, they're hybrids with the Asian cat. Um, and uh, they were, most cats are active for about 20% of the day. Bengals are active for 60%. I mean, it's, it is a threefold difference uh, on our sample of two, but, you know, I, don't, I have no reason to believe they were abnormal. Um, so, 
there is, and there is also a macho element as well, which I think, you know, I haven't, I haven't talked about reptile keeping, for example, which is a whole different ball game. I don't, I'm not sure what reptile keeping is. Um, I used to be sure uh, that, that it was a, just a thing that people did to show how strong they were. They're mostly, most people who keep reptiles are men, uh, not all, but, but many of them are. Um, and that they like to keep big snakes because it makes them feel good, um, makes them feel powerful, which is part of the motivation behind some kinds of dog training. It makes people feel powerful. It's got nothing to do with pets. It's to do with, with people's feelings about themselves. Um, so I think you know, the keeping of wolf dogs, um, the keeping of, of wild animals as pets um, is all to do with that. And then I came across an Australian study where, um, I, I, you have, well, I took it at face value. I'm not sure whether I should have done, but it said basically it was a survey of, of Australian reptile keepers who all claimed that their pets were members of the family and all that sort of stuff. I'm not quite sure whether they really meant that or whether the experimenter uh, asked them some slightly pointed questions in the questionnaire, which mean they thought, oh, this is the right answer, uh, which is always the problem with questionnaires and pet owners. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to say this, and so they did. So I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there are some people who have, and I've met people who have very affectionate relationships with their reptiles, but I'm not sure how it works. They're not very, they're not very common. Let's be said. Yeah, we have about uh, another five minutes, I think, for questions. Which one of you? Um, yeah, so you um, mentioned that pet, um, pet keeping evolved in modern humans. Um, so I wondered if you could sort of comment on um, pet keeping like behaviors in other animals. I, I'm, I'm actually racking my brain trying to think of a good example, but I think there was a chimp recently who had a, a, a pet kitten. Um, whether you think that's the same thing or whether it's um, sort of queuing in on um, uh, hormones that are given off through um, birth, etc. I don't know if I've articulated that very well, but... No, <laughs> I, I know. I, yes, yes, of course. Now, there are lots of... Uh, if, you, if you just trawl the internet, you'll find lots of pictures of uh, lions raising gazelles and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, they have, I think, exclusively happened in captivity under abnormal circumstances. So they are situations where the normal caregiving behavior of the uh, mother, uh, usually it's a mother, has been somehow tricked by some kind of, uh, kind of stress or mistake. Um, it doesn't happen. There's no evidence Nobody has ever come up with a convincing ex uh, example of it happening in the wild. Um, but, in, I mean, for example, if you're into cat rescue, you, you, people, you, people in cats, or some people in cat rescue use it all the time, because mother cats are not actually very good at recognizing their own kittens. I mean, mother sheep are very good at recognizing their lambs. Mother cats are not, in general, good at recognizing their own kittens. And so it's quite easy to foster kittens between one litter and another. Uh, if you've got a mother whose milk's dried up or has died uh, giving birth or something, the kittens can be farmed off. And the, the, so by manipulating the environment, you can quite easily trick animals into raising offspring that are not their own. And I think these much more widely publicized uh, events are, are examples, more extreme examples of the same thing. Um, can I just ask you about Munchausen's by proxy? Because I'm very interested in it, actually. I see um, a large number of people and their dogs and so on. And I've often wondered if some of these people actually go to their GPs less, but go more to their vets with their dogs and, um, you know, get that sort of uh, kind of sympathetic response and, and, you know, from the vets through their animals. And I have through their, you know, it could be cats or dogs, but I just see dogs and they're humans. And I don't know whether there's any research into it, but I do see, in I don't see a huge number, but enough to kind of, uh, spark something there that maybe there is something there. I mean, I can't do that research myself because I can't, you know, obviously do it. But has there been some? And have you found anything like that? There, there is some research going on in Denmark, um, as far as I know. Uh, well, it, it's being led by people in Denmark. I think the actual field research is going on in other countries as well. But it's led, led by a philosopher or ethicist called Peter Sando. So um, if you want to email me, I can put you in touch with him because uh, and, and, and I, he's publishing stuff all the time. Um, he was the one who, he actually talked about that at a British Veterinary Association meeting a couple of years ago about the possibility that 
um, some of the emotional bonds these people had with their dogs were kind of you know, they were it, it, they were taking on these dogs uh, because they were the only because they were sick because they knew they they knew they weren't fully functioning dogs but they were the only people who could look after them and it might be then that that's a less extreme version of the cat or dog hoarding phenomenon where people you know, fill their houses up with animals, and uh, when when they're asked, you know, to give them up, they say, "No, I'm, I won't give them up because I'm the only person in the world who understands these animals." They firmly get themselves into a situation where they firm they believe that even though the animals may not be in the best possible situation from the out, from the outside perspective, that they are the only people who can look after them, and they get very across when you t when the RSPCA take them away. Sorry, I. I Sorry, uh, yeah. sorry. Um, I also see people who have puppies who start to visit the vet more and more often, with fir first of all with minor things, and sometimes with almost imagined um, sort of illnesses that the dog's got for the vet to investigate and, and so on and so forth, not just people who rescue dogs, yeah, actually. Yeah, no, I've heard similar stories, but um, uh, I don't know of any research that's been done on it. I, mean, I think as it's something you might expect to happen because veterinary practices are becoming much less, in, you know, kind of animal doctors and much more about relationship doctors. And so you might expect people to start um, ex exploiting is perhaps the wrong word, but, but taking advantage of that um, and developing a much more social relationship with the whole thing rather than simply um, or rather than going to their GP and moaning to them. So, yeah, I think it's quite possible. But it would be, it'd be good to have some information about it, yeah. So, I think... Sando, S-A-N-D-O with a, one of those lines through it, sorry, to the Scandinavians here. I don't I've know what got, it's called. I've got a the e. microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know where I was. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I've read your book, John, thank you. And I'm really interested in the prevalence of the heritability. Like, what is... Do you think the, pre the prevalence of the genes of people that are um, pro-pets, do you think it's kind of quite a large population in well, the population? I, I mean, I don't know is the answer because the only right. decent quantitative study has been done on 50-year-old American white people who okay. served in the Vietnam War. Yeah. Um, because of the, the, the best, the easiest date kind of way to get this kind of data without taking, without taking DNA is the traditional twin study. So you compare fraternal and, okay. and maternal twins uh, and si siblings. Um, and so um, uh, that's the only data, you know, and this was spun out of another study. These studies, as yeah. you probably know, are very expensive. But there is one going on in New Zealand at the moment. I think there might be, like, I, I feel that there could be a correlation with the animal-assisted therapy outcomes and some of the data because... Is it just that there's a prevalence or heritability of the people that are coming out really well? And if you put that with how Herzog's foul draw effect, if we actually got the data together, it might be that the effects are just because some people in the population have a tendency towards wanting to be with animals and then some don't, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what that one genetic study suggests, is that, um, that there is something there uh, that if we, when people could only take it into account, if, they, if you could, could type somebody, is to say, well... Um, you know, this person is likely to react well or not. But at the moment, we just don't know, fortunately. But it would help a great deal, I'm sure, in targeting therapies properly. Thank you very much, and apologies for anyone I wasn't able to get to for questions, but that's all the time we have. So could we all thank John Bradshaw, please, for... Uh, <laughs>